I want to welcome you all to the University of Alabama uh, today for this great event. Uh, I'm Bill Bomar. I'm the Executive Director of the University of Alabama Museums. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the inaugural lecture of the John S. Steiner Lecture Series hosted by the University of Alabama Museums. I want to thank all, everyone for being here today, especially on a Saturday um, at 11 a.m. You know, we, we, we uh, knew this would be a popular event, but we still didn't want to go up against the football game. So uh, that's why we have a little bit earlier time. Um, I want to recognize Joe Messina, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and thank him for being here and for all of his support of the University of Alabama Museums. The goal of this lecture series is to bring respected scholars to campus to speak on topics of interest not only to the university community, but to the broader community, the general public, people of all ages. And I look out in the audience and I see that and it thrills me and it thrills our staff in the museums. Uh, we will feature speakers whose work relates to the disciplines that are emphasized by our five public University of Alabama museums and our collections. Future speakers may include archeologists, historians, or paleontologists. This lecture series is made possible by a generous gift from John Steiner, who's with us today. I wanna to thank John, he's here with his family up here. Um, he, John loves museums of all kinds. Uh, I've enjoyed hearing his reviews of some of the great museums that he and his family um, have visited on their travels. He's enjoyed participating in University of Alabama museums programs, and he and his sons have collected fossils, including shark's teeth, uh, on, on these trips. Um, John's an active member of the uh, Museum Advisory Board, the University of Alabama Museum's Board of Regents, and he has also endowed a scholarship for graduate museum studies students at the University of Alabama. Uh, in fact, one of our museum studies students is Rachel the Shark, who is, is out front. Um, John is an attorney in Birmingham where he's active in many community activities. He is a graduate of the University of Alabama School of Law. So I would like to, and I'm not going to make uh, John, since he's sitting in the middle, uh, come through the crowd, but I'd like to present John with this certificate, thanking him for his support and for the lecture series. And could we all give him a round of applause? It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Friel, director of the Alabama Museum of Natural History, who's also the interim chair of the Department of Biological Sciences, and he will introduce our speaker. Good morning, everyone. I'm super excited to introduce our inaugural Steiner Lecture speaker, uh, Dr. David Schiffman. I've been following uh, Dr. Schiffman's research and social media posts uh, for years. And uh, we're really happy we finally have an opportunity to bring him uh, to the university to talk about his things he's passionate about, um, sharks and the conservation of their, of their uh, species and related uh, taxa. Uh, Dr. Schiffman is a marine conservation biologist with a background in inter uh, interdisciplinary um, study of sharks and developing policies to protect them. Um, he has been fascinated with sharks since he was a young uh, boy and with marine biology in general. And this has led him to pursue uh, degrees. He has a Bachelor of Science from Duke University, a Master's from the Ch College of Charleston, and a PhD from the University of Miami. Um, he currently holds a research faculty position at Arizona State University's Science Policy Think Tank in Washington, D.C., while also running a consulting firm for conservation communications and policy. Additionally, he sits on the board of directors of two professional societies, the Society of Conservation Biology Marine Section and the American Elasmobranch Society. His extensive body of research includes over 50 peer-reviewed publications, which have amassed more than 1,000 citations. Uh, He's also a regular contributor to the pop popular publications such as National Geographic, Scientific American, The Washington Post, and has a monthly column in Scuba Diving Magazine. Um, he also has given more than 200 uh, media interviews and is quoted this week, actually, in the New York Times on a, an article discussing a recent discovery of a species of a cat shark in Australia that lives inside sponges. Um, 
This weekend, Dr. Schiffman's talk will be his 58th talk uh, as part of his international book tour for the, his book, Why Sharks Matters. And he invites you to follow him on various social media. All of them, he's under Why Sharks Matter is his uh, title. And uh, like I said, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end, as well as following the lecture, there will be a reception over in Smith Hall. Uh, for those of you that have reserved a copy, uh, Dr. Schiffman will be signing those copies. So without further ado, I'm happy to introduce Dr. David Schiffman. Thank you, John, for that introduction, and Bill, and everyone for being here on a Saturday. I'm excited to speak with you today about something that has been my absolute favorite thing to talk about since I was way younger than anyone in this room, and that is sharks and the ocean and marine biology. As John mentioned, I'm in the midst of an uh, international book tour talking about my new book, Why Sharks Matter. And as some of you who follow me on social media may know, on the, this is my 58th book tour, and I don't repeat outfits on these. I have a lot of shark shirts. But this presents us with a bit of a problem, and I need your help to resolve it. You may have heard that Jimmy Buffett passed away uh, recently. In addition to being a uh, multi-platinum selling musician, Jimmy Buffett was an avid ocean conservationist, the founder of the Save the Manatee Club and things of this nature. Um, and also wrote one of my all-time favorite songs about sharks, fins. And the outfit that I was planning on wearing for today's talk is the official Jimmy Buffett Margaritaville brand fins model. And I thought it would be appropriate to wear for this, but I did not consider that the shirt is what uh, Bama fans would call an unfortunate shade of orange. <laughs> so I want to ask for your permission, be a round of applause, if I can wear the orange Jimmy Buffett shirt. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> so with that out of the way, let's get started. As John mentioned, I am an interdisciplinary marine conservation biologist. I want to talk a little bit about what that means and how it's different from a little bit of the marine biology that you might be more familiar with. So marine conservation biology is I am not just studying where do fish go, where do, what do fish eat, things like that, but explicitly looking at endangered and threatened species and their threats and how science can be used to help understand how to protect, protect them. And interdisciplinary, what that means is I don't just look at the fish, I look at the people side. I gave a seminar here for the biology department in this very room yesterday afternoon. I see some of you nerds are back again. <laughs> uh, and that work was about my research on understanding what do people know about sharks? What do people fear about sharks? What do people want for sharks? Things like that. And what this means is every day is a little different. Some days I'm out in the field tagging sharks in South Florida. Uh, we actually did a fundraiser associated with the launch of the book where 20 of my book readers got to join me for a day of shark research in South Florida. Uh, not scientists, just people who are reading the book and entered a contest and won. And doing that, we raised $14,000 for marine biology scholarship, so I'm very proud of that. It means some days I'm talking on the news or writing for outlets like John was talking about. It means I spend a lot of time traveling around to universities and museums all over the world, and sometimes I get to dress up like an idiot and speak at schools and things like that. So this is not the exact model that Rachel has, but it's from, uh, from the same manufacturer, and I yes, I do hate myself that I know that. <laughs> I'm also very active on social media, and in, uh, if you're curious to learn more about any of these topics, I invite you to follow me at Why Sharks Matter, and we do have some copies of the book that I'll be signing afterward. If we run out, if you got a copy somewhere else, and send me a self-addressed stamp envelope and tell me you were at this talk, I'll send you a signed book plate sticker. So I've, as I mentioned, I've loved sharks for a really, really long time. I'm four years old in that picture. And today, I want to explain to you why I've loved sharks so much and how they've held my attention for so long and some of the things that I've learned in a career studying them and a lifetime of being obsessed with them. And in, the, in doing so, I want to introduce you to some of the key themes of my new book. Following the talk, there'll be time for questions. I do an Ask Me Anything on social media every week, which means that I can just about guarantee that the weirdest question you can think of to ask me is not the weirdest question I've ever been asked. So you can really ask anything about sharks, about the ocean, about marine biology, about me, 
Uh, happy to answer anything, but just I ask that you please, please hold those questions until the end of the talk. I'll note here that that is not the earliest picture of me with a shark, but it's the earliest picture of me with a shark that we could find, and that is at Sea Camp, Marine Biology Camp, in the Florida Keys, of which Jimmy Buffett was on the board of directors and funded 10 students to attend every year. So I love working with zoos and aquariums and science museums. Many of my uh, book tour stops have been at venues, uh, venues such as this. And I grew up in Pittsburgh, like you, pretty far from the ocean. Uh, actually, slightly farther. I mapped, it, I mapped it out in preparation for this talk. My home, childhood home, was 34 miles farther away from the ocean than we are in this room right now. But I fell in love with the ocean because of zoos and aquariums and science museums. That's me, that's my younger brother at the Pittsburgh Zoo where I saw the first sharks I ever saw as a kid growing up. This is stop number 58 on my book tour. That was stop one in front of the shark tank at the Pittsburgh Zoo. So it was a real full circle moment for me and it's been really been a pleasure working with zoos and, zoos and aquariums and science museums throughout this tour. Since this question has often come up, uh, at the end, yes, that is a caution wet floor sign next to the 100,000 gallon shark tank. They said it's been leaking for 15 years, they don't know why, and it'll probably be fine. <laughs> so one of the things that I love about sharks is they're so weird. They're so different from many other groups of animals, and that starts on their inside with their skeleton. I want everyone to, to join me in holding your arm out in front of your face. Take a point about halfway between your wrist and your elbow and try to bend your arm there. Hopefully you can't. <laughs> now crinkle your ears, crinkle your nose. You feel how much more flexible that is? This is bone. Our skeletons are made out of bone. Something like a largemouth bass or a yellowfin tuna, their skeletons are made out of bone. Your dog, your cat, your pet parrot, all of that is bone, but not sharks. They don't have any bones. Their skeletons are made out of cartilage, which is what our ears and nose are made out of. So sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras, the, the shark relatives, are fish, but they're a different group of fish from the largemouth bass and the tuna or your pet goldfish. Those are the bony fishes, and these are the cartilaginous fishes. Cartilage is lighter than bone, it heals faster than bone, and it's more flexible than bone, but it's not as strong. Sharks also have a whole other way of perceiving the world that we do not have. We have five senses, right? Sharks have more than that. They can sense bioelectric fields. Let me tell you why that's helpful if you're a shark. If you have a prey animal that is hiding under the mud or sand, and you can't see it or hear it or smell it, we would starve. But not sharks, they can tell us there because they can sense the electricity given off by that shark's beating heart and contracting muscles. And they know that something's hiding under there and they can dig it up, which is, I think, very cool. They also use this sense to navigate in the open ocean where there's no street signs, there's no GPS, there's no landmarks. How do they know where they're going? They follow the Earth's magnetic field. Um, so the gentleman who discovered this, Ad Kalmin, uh, passed away in 2021, and I got to write about his life and legacy for American Scientist magazine in a, a free, a free online in American Scientist May issue of last year, if you want to learn more about this. So there's a lot of shark nerds in this audience. I see someone has brought their shark plushie. I see lots of shark t-shirts. We even have Rachel dressed as a shark out front. I bet, I wonder how many shark species we could name if I gave you 10 seconds here. Just shout them out, go. Sharks. What? Whale shark. shark, good one, keep going. Bull Goblin, bull, bull, thresher, great white, tiger, megamouth, cookie cutter, hammerhead, mako, lemon, wobbegong. All right, stop. I counted 14 species there, that's pretty good. You, you guys are a bunch of nerds. There are 536 known species of sharks. And there is a new species of shark, skate, ray, or chimera discovered somewhere in the world every two weeks. So for the, for the little ones in the audience here who might want to be a marine biologist when you grow up, like I guarantee at least one of your parents did at one point, there's still going to be plenty for you to do. I want to introduce to you some of the diversity of this amazing group of animals because most people have only, can only think of a few species of sharks. And when most people picture a shark, you picture a great white or something like that. But to give you a sense of how amazingly well adapted and amazingly biodiverse these animals are, here are a few of my favorite weirdos. 
In the lower right, that is the American pocket shark. It is not called that because it's small enough to fit in your pocket, though it is. Blown up on this screen, that's significantly bigger than they are as a doll. It's called that because they have a little pocket of flesh behind their eye. You can see the little slit there that's full of glow-in-the-dark liquid that they can squirt to scare away predators. And you might not think of sharks as having predators, but when you're that big, a lot of things are your predator. In the lower left, that is a mega mouth shark. There's a few things that I love about mega mouth sharks. One is their scientific name. There's a bunch of museum nerds here. I'm sure you've seen uh, scientific names next to specimens. Most scientific names translate to something like the brown bird with the gray spot on its head. Descriptive, if not especially evocative. This is Megacosma Pelagios, the giant mouth of the deep. By science standards, that's poetry. <laughs> These animals also have glow-in-the-dark gums that attract prey. They live in the deep sea. Where, there's no uh, where the sunlight never reaches, and prey animals have not seen light. And they go check it out and swim right into the Mega Mouth's mouth, which is, for me, snack time goals. <laughs> In the center here, you have an angular rough shark. When most people think about sharks, what you think about is a sleek, powerful, fast, athletic, muscular. This is the opposite of that. These are the couch potatoes of the ocean. And especially since about March 2020, I've been relating to their lifestyle more and more, like I know many of you have. Um, and just picture an overinflated football with a giant, comically large dorsal fin glued to the top, and you're well on your way to an angular rough shark. You have all these other stripes and colors and weird tails, and there's just an unbelievable biodiversity of shark species. They live in just about every habitat that you can imagine. There are Shark species don't just live um, in the ocean or at the mouths of rivers. Some species have go pretty far up rivers. There's a story that I'm writing for Slate right now about a, a population of bull sharks that live in a golf course water hazard for 10 years. They got there after a flood, after a hurricane. Uh, some sharks live in the deepest part of the ocean where sunlight never reaches. The US Navy SEALs have a saying that if you want to know if there are sharks in the ocean near you, what you do is you dip your finger in the water and you taste it. And if the water is salty, that means you're in the ocean and there are probably sharks near you. <laughs> and that's true, but it's incomplete because some species live in freshwater. So just an incredibly biodiverse and well-adapted group of animals. They also have incredible behaviors. That's a goblin shark, which someone over here shouted out. Lots of animals can hyperextend their jaws in front of their face. Uh, snakes famously do this. But nothing does it as far or as fast as a goblin shark. That video is, shown, is slowed down 100 times so you can see what's happening. Uh, that video is of a Greenland shark. It is not slowed down. They are the slowest moving large animal in the ocean. But they are in no particular hurry. Since they are the longest lived vertebrate, they can live to be over 400 years old. They also eat polar bears. Love my Greenland sharks. Thresher sharks have this comically large tail that can be longer than the rest of their body combined. And until 2013, when a scuba diver shot this video, no one had any idea what they use that for. They use it as a whip. It makes a shockwave underwater. It stuns little prey fish, and then they can go munch on them. This is a kite fin shark, the largest of the shark species whose whole bodies glow in the dark. There are lots of shark species whose whole bodies glow in the dark, called the lantern sharks. My favorite lantern shark is called the ninja lantern shark. And it is called that because my friend and colleague who discovered it, Vicky Vasquez, discovered it around the time of uh, Thanksgiving and was home with her family. And everyone was talking about what's new at school, what's new at work. And she said, I discovered this new shark species, and I get to name it whatever I want. And one of her young cousins runs into the room and says, ninjas are cool. Call it the ninja shark. So she did. <laughs> I challenge you to find a more wholesome science story than that. There are, in fact, lots of shark species in Alabama. And Alabama sharks have been in the news most recently. These sharks are over uh, at, the, at the Museum of Natural History gift shop. There's been a lot, they've been having a lot of fun advertising this talk. But there are at least 16 species of sharks found in the waters of uh, Alabama. Um, including the sandbar shark, my favorite. Follow hashtag best shark to learn all about the sandbar shark. But your uh, deep sea fishing rodeo has uh, is recently reopened shark categories, and that has caused some uh, 
caused some controversy in some, controver in some conservation circles. So another place where shark, sharks are incredibly diverse and well adapted is where baby sharks come from. And I apologize to the parents in the audience, but you know you can't come to a shark talk anymore and not hear at least one baby shark joke. I don't make the rules. <laughs> Some sharks give live birth, just like mammals. What you're seeing there is a baby lemon shark being born. Sharks have no parental care at all, so that shark has to immediately just be a little shark and take care of itself. It will probably never see its mother or father again. Some shark species lay eggs. This is actually a skate egg case at an aquarium with the top removed, so you can see what's happening. Some have a weird mix of this that is only found in sharks, where they, they grow up in eggs, hatch within eggs inside the mother, and then are born as if live birth. Some sharks can clone themselves. This was discovered at an aquarium in Omaha, where they had three female bonnethead sharks in that tank for many, many years. And one morning, people came to work, and there were a bunch of baby sharks. They wondered, uh, hey, what the heck? There's no daddy shark here. What happened? And they checked. And they were all exact clones of one of the mothers. Uh, so there are you know, just an unbelievable diversity of where sharks, baby sharks, come from. So when, when most people think about sharks, they think about sharks as being a threat to you or your family. And that's a, mi a big myth that I want to dispel for you here. Yes, some people are hurt by sharks. Every once in a while, someone's even badly hurt or even dies. But this is just not something that you need to worry about. It is astronomically unlikely. And a big part of why people worry about this is because of a movie called Jaws. For the adults in the audience here, we are coming up on the 50th anniversary of the release of Jaws. Um, and in two weeks, I'm heading to New York City to see the Broadway show, The Shark is Broken, about the making of Jaws. I'm very excited. Uh, so it's a great movie, but it led to this b widespread belief among the public that that's how sharks really act. And it's not. We actually have something called the Jaws effect in the public policy literature now, which describes how fictional portrayals of real world issues affect how the public actually thinks about that issue and what they do, what's, uh, how it affects their policy preferences. Um, another case where a fictional portrayal of a, of a science topic has led to widespread public misunderstanding is Jurassic Park. If I ask you to think of a T-Rex, you think of the T-Rex from Jurassic Park, even though we know that's not what they look like and we knew that at the time the movie came out. So Spielberg has a lot to answer for here. <laughs> uh, but I should note, that Peter Benchley, the author of Jaws, felt so bad about how the, the book and movie made people terrified of, of sharks that he spent much of the rest of his life fundraising for shark conservation. And that ninja lantern shark I mentioned earlier, its scientific name to honor this is Benchley Eye. So when I say that sharks are not something you need to worry about, let's put that into context here. More people die in a typical year from flower pots falling on their head when they walk down the street then are killed by sharks. More people are bitten by other people on the New York City subway system every year <laughs> than are bitten by sharks in the whole world. And I, I always love looking around the audience. I can always tell who's been to New York City by how you react to that statistic. And some people going, that doesn't make sense. And some people going, yeah, I can see it. Um, vending machines, I got a, a very angry phone call when my book came out. Um, that apparently this statistic is out of date anymore. Under the Obama administration, OSHA changed rules about vending machine construction, and these things are not the death traps that they used to be anymore, and why didn't I know that? Well, that's not the sort of thing that people know. <laughs> but it used to be true that vending machines killed more people in a typical year than sharks did. Uh, and I, I will note uh, that I do not know anyone who had ever been badly injured by a shark, and I know three people who've been badly injured by vending machines. <laughs> As a social media guy, I love this one. More people die falling off cliffs while trying to take a selfie of the scenery behind them than are killed by sharks in a year. So this is just not something that you need to worry about. Every once in a while there's an injury, every once in a while there's a death, but it's astronomically unlikely, it's way overhyped. And not only are sharks not bad, they're actively good. They help keep the food chain and the food web in balance. And when we're talking about the ocean and our coasts, these are systems that provide billions of humans with food security and tens of millions of humans with jobs. It is important to have healthy oceans and coasts and that means, keep, means keeping the ocean food web healthy and that means keeping the top of the food web healthy. 
This is my favorite food web diagram, and you know you're a healthy, well-adjusted person when you have a favorite food web diagram. <laughs> Don't worry if you can't read the individual squares here, but I'll, I want to walk you through this a little. What you're seeing is the food web off Cape Cod. The, squa the individual squares are species of fish, halibut, mackerel, sculpin, flatfish. Some of them are marine invertebrates, like squid, scallops, mussels. There's birds on here, there's seals, there's marine mammals. And all the little arrows are ecological interactions between them. If I were to pull one of these threads, the system would probably be okay. What if I pulled five? What if I pulled 10? What if I pulled 20? You'd start to get worried about the integrity of the system, and that's really what we're doing. And because of something called top-down control, predators eating something below them is disproportionately ecologically important. So when you remove predators, it can have all sorts of crazy ripple effects through the system, all sorts of bad, unpredictable things. We do not want to see what happens if we lose sharks. Um, and the reason why this is my favorite food web diagram, with all this complication, the title of this diagram is a simplified food web of the Northwest Atlantic. So it's even worse than this. There's also something called fear ecology, which I think is one of the coolest things happening in animal behavior research right now. And in this case, the mere presence, or even possible presence, of a predator causes prey animals to change where they go and what they do. Um, if you've ever not cut through a dark alley at night to get back to your car, you've gone a longer way around um, to, because you feel it's safer and therefore worth spending more energy and time. That's fear ecology. It's the same premise. Uh, what you're seeing here is a satellite photo of the Great Barrier Reef. And the individual rocks or the or dots here are, are coral heads, coral bombies, individual units of a coral reef. And the, the brown is seagrass, and the white is sand where the seagrass has been eaten by herbivores. So what you're seeing here is exactly how far herbivorous fish that live in these coral heads are willing to venture out from safety in order to graze. Um, this, is a, this paper title is another example of poetry in science. It's called A Halo of Fear Visible from Space. Love this paper. It's worth noting that this idea that sharks are ecologically important shows up a lot in conservation advocacy. I asked uh, the environmental nonprofit community when you tell people we need to save sharks, why do you say we need to save sharks? And the number one reason by far, more than all the other reasons combined, is sharks are important to an ecosystem and when you lose them, bad things happen. It's no accident that my book and my social media is why sharks matter and not, I like sharks, can we please save them because they're my faves. Unfortunately, I have some bad news. Now that you know that sharks are important to a healthy functioning ecosystem, we have to talk about how many species are threatened. We said at the start that I work on how to save threatened species from extinction. The problem is so bad and has gotten worse so fast that this beautiful infographic from 2015 is already out of date. It's already worse than this. This infographic says one in four known species of sharks and their relatives are assessed as threatened with extinction by the IUCN Red List. It's now closer to one in three and that's since 2015. The number one threat by far, so much that there is functionally not a number two threat, is us, is humans. It's unsustainable overfishing. We are killing too many sharks. You may have heard of this dish of shark fin soup or shark finning. Lots of people who are sort of casually involved in ocean conservation have heard of this boogeyman of the shark world. Uh, but this is not the biggest threat to sharks and it has not been the biggest threat to sharks in, in the entire lifetimes of many of the people in this room. This is what we call in, uh, con in science a zombie idea, a concept that's so well established that it just does not die, no matter how many times you try to, to bust it. But over the same time frame, the quantity of shark meat being traded has risen enormously. So more sharks are being killed now, but not for their fins, not for shark fin soup. It's for shark meat. Importantly, those have different end markets. Shark fin soup is primarily consumed in China, Southeast Asia, and those cultures, diaspora communities around the world. And in some respects, that made it an easy villain for Western culture. But shark meat, you can get this at Publix. This is very, this is in our backyard. Um, and in some cases, it's fine. Sustainable shark fisheries are absolutely a thing that exists. Many of them are in the US. But this is a mako shark steak. That's a critically endangered species. Um, we should not be eating these. I have also talked to some members of the environmental community who have told me that a bowl of shark fin soup, that's evil, that's vile, that's morally repulsive, but that, that's fine. Uh, 
you should check your biases there, friend, because either way, you've got dead sharks on your hand. And in this case, you're saying the sharks that are being killed by other people far away, that's a big problem, but the sharks being killed in my backyard, that's fine. That's just straight up racism. And there are big issues with this in the environmental community. You can be forgiven for never having heard of the shark meat trade because I did an analysis of how shark conservation is portrayed in newspapers. And the shark fin trade and the shark meat trade over the last decade, during which time the shark fin trade has never been the biggest threat to sharks, it's portrayed six and a half times as often as the shark meat trade is. Um, it's, it's flashy, it's simple to focus on, everyone's sort of vaguely heard of it. And this is a problem in terms of public misunderstanding. Another thing that I've learned in my career, and a, and a big part of the reason why I wanted to write this new book, is there's some scary news on the horizon. If we don't act, many of these shark species are in trouble, but we can act. We know what to do. We know how to help. We know what policies work. We know when they work. We know what they, we need to make them work. We know when we need your help to make them work. And there, is, there was simply, before I wrote this book, not a guide for the interested general public out there about this. There are lots of books about sharks that are out there, but most of them are fun facts about sharks. And then on the last page it says, sharks are in trouble, save them, don't eat shark fin soup. There, the, the problem is more complicated than that, it's more nuanced than that, and most of the books that were available about this topic were not written for the general public, they were written for people like me who have PhDs. So I wanted to explain the world of shark conservation policy to the people who we need to understand it so we can help. You, did, you didn't come here for a law school lecture, so I'll be quick going through this, but I want to briefly introduce some of the different policies that are out there to give you a sense of how complicated this is and to some extent how you've been lied to about how complicated it is. The number one threat facing sharks, as I mentioned, is unsustainable overfishing. We are killing too many sharks. One school of thought says to fix that, let's make the fishing more sustainable. If you've ever been fishing for anything, you're familiar with these sorts of rules. Size limits. If it's too small, you throw it back so it can have babies before you catch it. Quotas. You can only catch this many sharks in a year. Um, these tools work for sharks. Absolutely they do. The unequivocally, yes. I talked about this extensively at the seminar yesterday. But in recent years, there's been this newer school of thought that says, no, we need to ban all shark fishing everywhere. We need to ban all sale of shark products everywhere because there's no such thing as sustainable fishing. Uh, to some extent, this is a new iteration of an old argument. This is the argument between Gifford Pinchot, the ch first chief of the US Forest Service, and John Muir, who was involved in the creation of the National Park Service. This is conservation versus preservation. This is, are we saving nature so we can benefit from it, or are we saving nature for nature's sake? It's not a new argument, but it's a, a fascinating new example. Now, most, most Westerners would agree that uh, anchovies are a natural resource to be sustainably exploited, and the great whales are part of wilderness to be preserved. Sharks sort of fall awkwardly in the middle here. And as someone who is an interdisciplinary conservation biologist, this makes it a fascinating place to work. But it does mean that sometimes my social media mentions are unusable for days at a time. If you've never before heard of sustainable fisheries for sharks and you consider yourself pretty well versed on ocean conservation, I should note that 90% of the scientists in the world who study sharks support this as a policy over ban. And if you've never heard of before of a policy that 90% of the experts in the field say, yes, this is clearly the path forward, I would encourage you to consider where you're getting your information from. And finally, the last theme I want to talk about, and those of you who follow me on social media, I know there are some of you nerds in the audience because you told me you were coming. Um, it's great that so many people want to help. It's great that so many people are trying to help. But wanting to help and trying to help are not the same thing as actually helping. There are lots of people who do well-intentioned nonsense. That it doesn't make anything worse, but it doesn't make anything better, and it, makes, uh, it complicates the issue and it dilutes the limited resources of the environmental movement. There are lots of people who are well-intentioned but misinformed and are earnestly trying, but there are also people who are exploiting the well-intentioned but misinformed. Uh, there's a lot of straight up fraud in ocean conservation nonprofit world because of this. Some humorous examples of this, or at least I think they're at least I think they're funny. We've already discussed how well no how normal and well adjusted I am. Um, there are 
A term I'm trying to get introduced in the peer-reviewed scientific journal literature is macho cowboy idiot scuba diver. Um, and they, these macho cowboy idiot scuba divers, they grab sharks and they flip them over. They hug them, they ride them, they kiss them. They take a shark, they take the bitey end of that shark, and they put it on their face. And when, when challenged about this, they say, oh, I'm doing science, I'm doing conservation. No, you're not. I don't know what the heck is happening in this picture, but it's not science and it's not conservation. A particular bugaboo of mine is these goofy online petitions to ban shark finning. And we have some young ears in the audience today, so I won't go into what shark finning is and isn't. But it's worth noting, this petition from 2022 to ban the practice of shark finning in Florida got 60,000, 60,000 signatures on it. Not one of those people apparently knew that we banned shark finning in Florida in 1993. <laughs> so this is a policy, this is a, a petition that cannot possibly accomplish anything all it does is it confuse people, is confuse people about what the problems are, confuse people about what the solutions to those problems are, and make people think they helped when they didn't, and really we could have used their help on something else. So what I, I've introduced to you now some of the key themes of my book. Um, I, I hope that you've enjoyed it. As I mentioned, I wanted to write this book because there was nothing else out there that had the breadth of of science and conservation policy world in it, but was accessible to people who weren't PhDs. And I've been absolutely thrilled with the reception that it's gotten so far. I had no idea how, how long this book tour would go. Uh, I got to give a talk in Antarctica in January about this book. That was very cool. Uh, I was at one point the number one Amazon bestseller for science, passing Jane Goodall's new book, which childhood me would absolutely not have believed. This book got reviewed in the New York Times. I was featured on NPR Science Friday. And traveling around to talk about it has uh, been absolutely wonderful. So I am uh, I'm thrilled to be here as, this as part of this inaugural lecture. That, but this is part of a, a uh, longer book tour for me, and it is still going. If any of you in the audience or anyone watching the recording later represents a group that is interested in talking more about this, let's chat. I'm easy to find. Um, for watching later, why sharks matter at Gmail. For anyone here, I have a stack of my cards here next to these shark jaws. And uh, I can zoom into your kids' science class or things like that, never a charge for public schools or public libraries. So happy, to, I, I love to keep this going. Uh, before we wrap up and I take your questions and before we head over across the street for the reception, I have some folks to thank here. I wanna thank the Alabama Museum of Natural History and the, and the University of Alabama Museum System, especially John for reaching out and arranging this, and the Steiner family for setting up this lecture series, which I know will be amazing for years to come. I wanna thank my family for always supporting my crazy career goals. When I was five years old, I told my dad I wanna be a marine biologist. And he said, I don't know what that is, but I'll find out. And he's always been supportive. And I think they always thought I'd grow out of this and uh, become a lawyer like him, uh, but I never did. And now he's retired and he takes his golf buddies on shark research trips with me. So I feel like I'm with him. I want to thank my publisher, Johns Hopkins University Press. They gave me a lot of freedom to write this very different kind of shark book. This is one type of example for uh, a different type of shark book. Johns Hopkins University Press is a venerable 120-year-old academic publishing house. My book draft was responsible for them calling an all editors meeting to finally decide on a house style for whether or not you capitalize both words in Florida man. <laughs> they, I, I, I want to thank friends and colleagues for years of listening to me talk about my idea for a different kind of shark book and fact checking um, and all their support throughout this. And finally, I want to extend a deep and sincere thanks to you. I'm having the time of my life right now traveling around the world talking about my favorite thing to talk about, and I could not do that if no one wanted to listen. So before I take your questions, I just want to tell a quick funny story. Um, I was a sponsor of the 2019 Sigma Xi conference, uh, basically an international science fair. And all these science nerd kids from all over the world were presenting, it was very cool. And I had this, ask me anything you want about sharks booth uh, in the exhibitor hall. And we opened, the last day we opened it up to the town of Madison, Wisconsin. So people were coming in off the street asking shark questions. I did this for three days, it was amazing. At one point I got up to go to the bathroom and I come back and there is an eight year old boy sitting in that chair answering people's questions about sharks. <laughs> and I sat and watched him for a few minutes and he got most of it right. So maybe, uh, maybe uh, looking around at some of the young faces in the audience here, I can finally retire from this and some of you will take over. Thank you so much for listening. I'm happy to take your questions. What can 
to answer for folks, please. Yeah, this is not a planted question, you guys. No, Shark Week is a dumpster fire of nonsense and lies. If you Google, if you Google my name and Shark Week, you will get countless reading materials that will amuse you for a long time. Uh, we actually, other than just being critical of the, the nonsense and lies that they put on there all the time, we actually just did a study about Shark Week. We had two poor undergraduate volunteers who volunteered to watch all of Shark Week ever, uh, 202 hours, and write down just what's in it. And what, who were the experts they featured? What did they say? Where did they go? What species did they work on? All of this. And my field is about 60% women. You would not know that from watching Shark Week, where not only are there more men than uh, women featured, there are more men named Mike than women <laughs> featured. That was a quote that got us a lot of media pickup. Uh, it was on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me as one of the goofy answers. Um, several of, uh, several uh, conservative politicians were mocking it on social media. It was great. So yeah, no, Shark Week's trouble. Please. Um, what is your opinion about aquariums or sea water that uh, profits from animals that they have uh, in um, Great question. Yes, the question is about the role of aquariums um, and animal captivity in some of these issues. So there are some aquariums that are trouble, uh, but those that are AZA certified, so the uh, Association of Zoos and Aquariums, I think, yeah, uh, they have very, very high standards for animal care and animal welfare. They absolutely contribute to public understanding of, of the ocean. They absolutely raise money for science and conservation. Many employ scientists and conservationists. Um, there are some aquariums that are trouble, and some species that perhaps do not belong in aquariums. But sharks generally do fine. Great question. Thank you. Please. So to briefly give you guys some context with this, great question, thank you. Uh, so you, this, the Alabama Deep Sea Rodeo is a long-standing fishing tournament. It used to have a shark category. They stopped that for several years and it came back this year. And it got, this got picked up by some of the wackadoodles from Shark Week, um, including horror director Eli Roth, uh, who, wrote, who directed Hostel, among other things that you may have heard of. And they are just straight up lying about what is happening and it is resulting in some of my colleagues at Dauphin Island Sea Lab and at NOAA getting death threats from social media followers of Eli Roth. So I, I, uh, the, what's happening is the sharks are being killed as part of the tournament and then are being donated to scientists for research. And there are lots of research methods that absolutely require lethal sacrifice of sharks. Uh, do you guys know how you tell how old a shark is? Yeah. It's just like a tree, you cut it in half and you count the rings, really. And you can't do that on a shark that's alive. So that sort of data is actually really important. Um, and uh, there are, I, I don't think we need to be going out and trying to kill the biggest members of a rare species to win a piece of paper that says you did that personally. But I'm not anti-fishing, I'm just anti-wasteful fishing. And some of the rhetoric, uh, in particular from Paul de Gelder and Eli Roth, who are Shark Week people, has been extremely troubling, I think, border, borderline on a lawsuit worthy. Please. Maybe not Shark Tale, where the sharks are mobsters. Uh, I recently re-watched that with a friend who has twin seven-year-olds, and it's a lot more violent than I remember it being Shark Tale. Uh, but Will Smith was pretty good in it. Um, fi I mean, Finding Nemo has the, the sharks that swear off eating prey and say fish are friends. Not Yo, yes, sure. The question was about, are there, Jaws has been bad for public perception of sharks. Are there pieces of media that have been good? Uh, finding Nemo and fish are friends, not food, and all that. Like, that's not true. Fish are food for sharks, but it portrays sharks in a kinder, gentler light. Um, I think things like octonauts have been really great for younger kids, right? Yeah. So I, I, I see a lot of kids' faces lighting up here. Uh, th so, actually, my boss at ASU is the scientific consultant on octonauts, so I'll tell her that you were all excited that I got mentioned. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's, there's a growing appreciation. I, and I, I, I want to be clear that we should not 
be thinking of sharks as monstrous killing machines, but there's been this movement among macho cowboy idiot scuba diver world to say that actually sharks are just cute, adorable puppy dogs and they just need love and hugs and kisses. No, you wouldn't do that to a bear, I hope. <laughs> So it's really important that we strike a balance here. They're not monstrous killing machines, but they're wildlife and they can hurt you if you mess with them, so leave them alone. Uh, and just understanding their ecological role, Octonauts did very well with that, I thought. Unsurprising because a shark scientist is the consultant. Please. Great question. Do I think all types of seafood made from sharks are bad? No, absolutely not. Sustainable shark fisheries absolutely exist. Um, and it's what 90% of the, my survey of uh, colleagues, shark scientists around the world support as the, policy, as the preferred policy solution. We are killing too many sharks, which doesn't mean never kill any sharks for fisheries. It can be done sustainably. Uh, it can be done in a way that is not harmful to the environment. I'm certainly not encouraging you to go out and try shark. But if you see some species that are recommended by guides like Monterey Bay, Aquarium Seafood Watch or the Marine Stewardship Council where I used to work. Uh, you can trust that that's sustainable, but maybe don't try things just because, oh, that's weird, I've never tried it before. That's not, perhaps not the most sustainable lifestyle choice if you're curious, if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, but it can be done sustainably. Yeah, great question, thank you. In the back, please. What's your favorite shark? What's my favorite shark? The sandbar shark. Follow hashtag best shark on Twitter and Instagram to learn all about sandbar sharks. Not a planted question either. <laughs> Please. How do you feel like the ethics of like a pet transfer to say like a bamboo shark or a smaller gray? Yes, so the question's about touch tanks at aquariums. So if you've been to an aquarium, they often have a little area where you can stick your hand in, two finger, and touch the small animals. Um, this can be a great way to learn about animals. Like it's great that you guys are coming in on a Saturday to a museum to listen to a scientist talk, but most people don't do that. And getting to touch the animal can be a powerful experience that can lead to respect. Uh, I, I've never been to a touch tank where there wasn't at least one person violating the rules and messing with the animals, so maybe that's not great, but uh, aquariums usually cycle the animals through the individual animal. So it depends is the short answer. Yes, please. Can you say what the Megalodon is? Told you not. <laughs> There's always at least one question about the Megalodon. You, for those of you not familiar with Megalodon, uh, this was an ancient shark species. If you've ever been to an aquarium and they have the shark jaws you can stand in um, and with, your, with your whole family and take a picture, that's Megalodon. Absolutely was real, absolutely did, ex did exist, has been extinct for millions of years now. There's absolutely no doubt about that. Shark Week lied to you and your family about this. <laughs> Um, there's also the Jason Statham movie series, The Meg. The second one just came out. Um, I, I really hope that we get to the fourth one in the series. Uh, because It's a book series because when you get to Meg for Hell's Aquarium, there is a David Schiffman marine biologist character in there. So I'm hoping we can get Danny DeVito to play me. <laughs> but no, Megalodon is absolutely unequivocally extinct and has been for millions of years. And all of the evidence that you have seen on the internet about this is CGI or forged or I don't know why. I, I, this is the weirdest conspiracy theory that this, this fish is ex not extinct it's the, and scientists in the government know this and are lying to you about it. Uh, like why? What, is, what would I gain from doing this? Thank you. Please. about the effects of climate change on sharks. Let me tell you a quick story here. Uh, the short answer is not that much. Uh, most sharks can just move. Uh, it, climate change is absolutely real. It's a big problem for lots of marine life. Most sharks can just move out of the way. And I was a co-author on a paper that found the first evidence of this happening for large shark species in the United States, uh, bull sharks. This was led by Chuck Bangley, who some of you may know. Um, and when I moved to Washington, D.C., I started seeing these ads for the Washington DC Metro. They had this, old ad, this whole ad campaign that was all about um, the climate change benefits of taking public transit uh, rather than driving your own car. And it was saying things like climate change will destroy hops agriculture, save happy hour, take Metro, stuff like that. And then there was one that said, climate change will make sharks bite more people. Say, keep the sharks at bay, take Metro. 
and I, I loved. And their source was our people, which is, and that's absolutely not what it said. So there's a very particular type of torture for being a science commuter, communicator and having to walk by an ad that misuses your own research every day on your way to work. Still get chills thinking about that. But this got covered, this, my, my campaign to get this ad taken down got picked up by the Washington NPR station. It was very fun. But uh, climate change, absolutely real, absolutely a big threat to lots of marine life. Sharks mostly just move. Please. I think time for a couple more questions and then, yeah, please. Aside from uh, sustainable fishing strategies, what other conservation strategies would you support for uh, shark populations? Great question. What other sorts of, of policy solutions work for sharks? A big one that's being talked about a lot now, especially where I live and work in Washington, D.C., is marine protected areas. These are no fishing zones, like national parks in the ocean. And the Biden-Harris administration, along with, with collaborators around the world, have committed to what's called 30 by 30, which is fully protecting 30% of our coastal lands and waters uh, by the year 2030. And no one is going to meet that goal, but it helps to have goals because you can see where you are. Um, so marine protected areas, uh, this gets very, very dicey very quickly, especially if there are any uh, anglers in the room. I'm sure you've heard some discussion of this marine protected area designation. But to summarize, briefly summarize 25 years of policy fights about this, there is very broad agreement that a well-designed, well-enforced, well-implemented marine protected area is good for the ocean. And there's very broad agreement that the overwhelming majority of marine protected areas are not well-designed, well-enforced, well-implemented. Great question, thank you. Uh, last question here, and then I've had something from John. Yeah. Great question. Can, I, can shark paleontology help with modern shark conservation? And if so, how? Yes. Uh, and paleoconservation is increasingly a field. By understanding how animals that are no longer with us lived and where they lived and how they interacted with the world and to some extent how they died, we can hopefully prevent future extinctions and understand a little bit more about where are the species that are around today are coming from. Thank you. And I know we have one, one more question here. So following this, if, if you're not already aware, we will have a reception over in Smith Hall, and if you follow the chalk drawings on the sidewalk, uh, over in Smith Hall and Greg Dell will have food and drink. Uh, David will be signing copies of his book if you reserve those, and there may be an opportunity to ask some more questions. So my final question, I was going to ask David, uh, maybe if you could lead us in well, uh, and basically uh, helping celebrate and wishing a happy birthday to Brooke Fitzwater, who <laughs> is a UA graduate student in the Department of Biological Sciences. Very popular on TikTok with uh, under Ocean Lily, and actually helped promote uh, the whole series of videos to help promote it. So uh, it's her birthday this yeah. weekend, and she really helped a lot with the promotions of this, and really is very passionate about the local business and conservation. Yeah. So all right, join join me in singing Happy Birthday to Brooke, everyone. <laughs> all right, ready? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.